FJ series of fighters were produced by North American Aviation for the U.S. Navy and shared a number of similarities with the Air Force's F-86 Sabre. Since these planes are very similar and are all in the same series, I'm going to cover them all here and now, so consider this to be kind of the FJ special. There will be timestamps in the description, uh, I hope, to direct you to specific fighters should you want to see a specific fighter but not the others. So let's begin. And what better place to begin than with the beginning? The FJ-1 Fury was the U.S. Navy's first operational jet fighter. It was a transitional model, and it carried over tail services, wings, and cockpit from the venerable P-51D Mustang. The single-seat fighter had a length of 10.48 meters, 34 feet 5 inches, a wingspan of 11.53 meters, 38 foot 2 inches, a height of 4.52 meters, 14 foot 10 inches, and a wing area of 20.5 meters squared, or 221 square feet. It weighed just over 4,000 kilograms empty, 8,843 pounds, and 6,854 kilograms loaded, 15,118 pounds. It had an internal fuel load of 1,743 liters, 465 gallons, and 644 liters, 170 gallons, in each wingtip fuel tank. It was powered by one Allison J35A2 turbojet producing 4,000 foot-pounds of thrust. It had a maximum speed of 880 kilometers an hour at about 2,750 meters, 547 miles an hour at 9,000 feet. It had a range of 2,407 kilometers, 1,496 miles, with external fuel tanks. It could climb at a rate of 1,005 meters a minute at sea level, 3,300 feet a minute to a service ceiling of 9,753 meters, 32,000 feet. Its stall speed was about 194 kilometers an hour, or 106 knots or 121 miles an hour. The FJ-1 was armed with six Browning M2 50 caliber machine guns carrying 1,500 rounds of ammo in total. The FJ-1 was designed with a straight wing in the same vein as the P-80 and the North American XP-86 would also have this layout. The FJ-1 would be one of the major influences for the vastly more successful F-86 Sabre, which in turn would inspire the later FJ-2 and FJ-3. The Navy ordered the FJ-1 in late 1944, and the prototype competed with designs from Douglas and Vaught. The XFJ-1 first flew on September 11, 1946, with the first of three deliveries beginning in October the next year. The first squadron to get them was a VF-5A, and made the first jet aircraft landing aboard an aircraft carrier landing on the USS Boxer on March 10, 1948. It also was the plane that would highlight the need for catapult-assisted takeoff, as jets tended to be heavier than their piston-engine counterparts, and as a result needed a longer runway to make a rolling start, something that just couldn't be done on the current aircraft carriers. In fact, the Essex were about the lower limit of these new fighters, and jet aircraft made the older USS Enterprise CVN-6 completely obsolete. So if anything is to blame for the loss of the Enterprise, it's the FJ-1. Don't think too harshly of it, though, as it did pioneer the Navy's jet aircraft. The Fury was capable of an unassisted takeoff, but only if it had the entire deck cleared to make a running start, and when it did, it was only just in the air when its wheels left the flight deck. Since German research into swept wings had not yet become available, as mentioned before, the FJ-1 had a straight wing. Since the fighter had dive brakes on the wings, it also couldn't fold the wings. Instead, a unique kneeling nose undercarriage along with a swiveling jockey wheel, allowed the FJ-1s to be parked nose to tail, with one nose underneath the tail of the plane in front of it. The initial order of 100 was cut back to 30, and mainly for testing purposes at uh, Naval Air Station North Island, California. VF-5A was redesignated to VF-51, and it continued to operate the fighter beginning in August of 1948 aboard the USS Boxer. However, by mid-1949, they were being phased out for the F-9F-2 Panther. The FJ-1 was retired from the reserve forces in 1953. Its one major career highlight was VF-51's win of the Bendix Trophy race for jets in September of 1948, taking the first four places ahead of the California National Guard P-80. Two FJ-1s are on display, 120349 at the Yanks Air Museum in Chino, California, and 120351 at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. The FJ-2 and FJ-3 were swept-wing carrier-based fighters for the Navy and Marine Corps, and were the result of the effort to navalize the F-86 Sabre, as mentioned above. Navy-specific features included folding wings, longer nose struts to improve the angle of attack when landing, and a tail hook. These fighters were still single-seat, with a length of 11.46 meters, 37 foot 7 inches, with a wingspan of 11.316 meters, 37 foot 1 in, 1.5 inches, excuse me, 
and a height of 4.14 meters, 13 feet 7 inches, and a wing area of 26.8 meters squared, 288 square feet. They weighed 5,353 kilograms empty, 11,802 pounds, and had a max takeoff weight of 8,523 kilograms, 18,790 pounds. They were powered by one GE J47-GE2 turbojet producing 6,000 foot-pounds of thrust. It had a maximum speed of 1,086 kilometers an hour, or 587 knots, or 675 miles an hour at sea level, a range of 1,380 kilometers, 750 nautical miles, or 860 miles without tanks, could climb at a rate of 36.7 meters a second, 7,230 feet a minute, to a service ceiling of 14,300 meters, 46,800 feet. It was armed with four 20mm Colt Mark 12 cannons with 150 rounds in each gun. By 1951, the Navy's straight-wing fighters like the F-9F Panther were not faring particularly well against the communist MiG-15s operating in Korea, and its in-house swept-wing fighters like the F-9F Cougar and F-7U Cutlass weren't ready for deployment. And also, one of them was a steaming pile of crap. Topic for another video. Anyway, as a stopgap, the Navy ordered that the F-86E Sabre be navalized as the FJ-2 Fury. The F-86 is not a carrier aircraft. And if we recall the BF-109 and the Seafire, uh, we know about how well this tends to go. So needless to say, this meant there were going to be some risks involved. However, the Sabre had some clear advantages that might, for the first time, make a conversion from Air Force to carrier operations work. Uh, those being that the F-86 had a lower landing speed than the F-9F Panther, amongst others. A North American claimed that the swept-wing Sabre was, in fact, as good or better than its straight-wing contemporaries, and the F-9F-5's issues with stall speed threatened to have Grumman aircraft removed from carrier operations for the first time since the Navy had begun flying off the decks of ships. As a result of this urgency, 300 were ordered before the prototype even flew. This was later reduced to 200. The first prototype to fly was actually the third plane ordered, designated the XFJ-2B, flying for the first time on December 27, 1951. It differed from the Sabre in armament only, carrying four 20mm cannons instead of six 50 caliber machine guns. The second and third prototypes were fully modified for carrier operations, with tail hooks, longer nose wheel struts, and catapult fittings. Uh, they went for trials aboard the carrier USS Midway in August of 1952, and qualification trials on the USS Coral Sea from October through December of 1952. The results were less than satisfactory. Low-speed handling was bad, and the arrestor hook and landing gear weren't strong enough for carrier operations. Sounds oddly familiar, doesn't it? The first production FJ-2 flew on November 22, 1952. It incorporated further modifications for carrier operations, including a widened landing gear track, upward-folded outer wing panels, and a modified windscreen. It also featured the flying tail, something that the F-86 would also see modified. Several would be later modified further to strengthen the nose wheel. The FJ-2 used a navalized version of the J-47 found in the F-86F. In total, modifications to the FJ-2 had added about 500 kilograms to the design over the F-86, 1,102 pounds. And yet the fighter was still not suited for carrier operations, and instead it was given to land-based marine squadrons. Construction of the FJ-2 was slow due to the need for the Air Force F-86 in Korea. The FJ-2 would not see large-scale production until after the war was over. Only seven had been delivered at the end of 1953. VMF-122 received the FJ-2 first beginning in January 1954. The Navy preferred the F-9F Cougar due to its better slow-speed performance. Even though they were shelved by the Navy, they did see carrier operations with Marines, and they did try to help the issues but they were never satisfactory for carrier operations. In 1956, the FJ-2 disappeared from frontline service, and it was retired from the reserve force in 1957. While the FJ-2 was in development, a new version was planned to use the license-built Sapphire engine, the Wright J-65. The Sapphire promised an almost 30% uh, increase in thrust uh, for little weight gain. This new fighter was designated FJ-3, and 389 were ordered in March of 1952. The FJ-2-131931 was used to test the engine, but the first FJ-3 flew on July 3, 1953. Early FJ-3s had the wing of the FJ-2, but from 1955 they were built with the 6-3 wing, with the leading edge extended 6 inches at the root and 3 inches at the tip. Uh, this wing was pioneered on the F-86F and enhanced maneuverability at the expense of a slight increase in landing speed, 
with the removal of leading edge slats. The FJ3's 6.3 wing was further modified with a slightly different camber to aid in slow speed flying. It also allowed for extra fuel to be carried internally. Deliveries began in September 1954 and the FJ3 joined the fleet in May of 1955. It was the first fighter to land aboard the new supercarrier USS Forrestal in 1956. The J-65 began to show problems, including failures of the lubrication system under acceleration of launch or during maneuvers, along with turbine blade failure. Despite issues, though, the Navy was more satisfied with the FJ-3 than they had been with the FJ-2, and in 1954, an additional 149 were ordered. Its new engine made it superior to almost all models of F-86 Sabre, except the F-86H. 538 FJ-3s were built, 194 of them were the modified FJ-3M, with the ability to fire the heat-seeking AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missile. Some were modified to control the Regulus missile and the F-9F-6K Cougar target drones. In 1956, they were retrofitted for air-to-air -air refueling. They were retired in September of 1962. There are currently two FJ-2s and a total of six FJ-3s surviving today. The FJ-4 Fury was another North American swept-wing Navy fighter and the final development of the navalized F-86 Sabre. It was in broad strokes similar to its predecessors, but had many design differences. This single-seat fighter had a length of 11.1 .1 meters, 36 feet 4 inches, a wingspan of 11.9 meters, 39 feet 1 inch, a height of 4.2 meters, 13 feet 11 inches, and a wing area of 31.46 meters squared, 338.66 square feet. It weighed 6,000 kilograms empty, 13,210 pounds, 9,200 kilograms loaded, 20,130 pounds, and had a max takeoff weight of 10,750 kilograms, 23,700 pounds. It was powered by one Wright J65W16A turbojet, producing 7,700 foot-pounds of thrust. The FJ-4 had a maximum speed of 1,094 kilometers an hour at sea level, 680 miles an hour. It had a range of 3,250 kilometers, 2,020 miles, if it was carrying two 760-liter, 200-gallon, drop tanks, and two AIM-9 Sidewinders on board. It could climb at a rate of almost 39 meters a second, 127.67 feet per second to a service ceiling of 14,300 meters, 46,800 feet. It had a wing load of 341.7 kilograms per square meter, 69.9 pounds per square foot. It was armed with the same four 20 millimeter Colt Mark 12 cannons with 144 rounds a gun, 578 in total, and could carry any configuration of the following ordnance. Six LAU-3-A 70 millimeter rocket pods, four AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles, or 1,400 kilograms of underwing ordnance. Uh, that's about 3,000 pounds. Compared to the FJ-3, the FJ-4's newer wing was much thinner and had skin panels milled from solid alloy plates. It also had increased overall wing area, with wings tapering more towards the wing tips. Like the FJ-3, slight camber on the wing allowed for better slow speed handling. To support the new wing design, landing gear had to be modified, with the track again being widened. This hindered the wings folding to the outer wing only. The FJ-4 was intended as an all-weather interceptor, which required significantly more range. As a result, the FJ-4 had 50% again more fuel capacity than the FJ-3 and was lightened due to the removal of armor and cutting ammunition in the guns. The new wing also allowed for more fuel to be carried, called a wet wing. The fuselage was also deepened to allow for more fuel. This gave the fuselage a distinct razorback and rather hindered the bubble canopy a bit. Speaking of the cockpit, it was modified for longer-range missions. Tail surfaces were also changed to have a thinner profile. The resulting aircraft from all these changes resembled little of the FJ-3 except in the most basic sense. Same goes for the F-86 Sabre on which it was based. The first FJ-4 flew on October 28, 1954, and deliveries began in February the next year. Out of the original order of 221, the last 71 were modified to be the FJ-4B fighter-bomber with a stronger wing with six pylons and, and uh, stronger landing gear. Excuse me. Additional speed brakes were also added to make landing safer by allowing pilots to use more thrust. They were also useful as dive brakes. External load was doubled to over 2,721 kilograms, 6,000 pounds. It was also capable of carrying nuclear weapons on its inboard port wing. As a result, it was also equipped with the low-altitude bombing system, LABS, for the delivery of such a weapon. The Navy wanted to maintain its nuclear role in its rivalry with the Air Force, and it equipped 10 squadrons with the FJ-4B. Three Marine squadrons also received the B model. 
In April of 1956, the Navy ordered 151 further FJ-4Bs, bringing production total up to 152 FJ-4s and 222 FJ-4Bs. Six were ordered to be converted into the FJ-4F to test rocket engines, but only two were completed. These featured the North American Rocketdyne AR-1 engine installed above the jet engine. This engine ran on hydrogen peroxide and JP-4 jet fuel and provided an additional 5,000 foot-pounds of thrust for short periods. The FJ-4F reached speeds of Mach 1.41 and altitudes of 21,600 meters, 71,000 feet. The Navy's new designation system designated the FJ-4s as the F-1E and the FJ-4B as the AF-1E. The FJ-4B served in the Navy Reserve into the late 1960s. A total of 1,115 Furies were received by the Navy and Marine Corps over the course of its production life. Variants of the FJ-4 are as follows. The XFJ-4 prototype, the YFJ-4 was used for development testing, the FJ-4, the FJ-4B, the FJ-4F, the F-1E being the redesignation of the FJ-4, the AF-1E being the redesignation of the FJ-4B, and the AF-1F, which was a proposed light attack variant with the TF-30 engine, a competitor to the A-7 uh, Corsair, which wasn't built. The FJ-4 also probably saw service during the Vietnam War aboard the USS Hancock as part of the Black Diamond Squadron, uh, at least according to a couple of sources I've seen. Um, so if anyone has any more specific information about that, let me know, because I think that's uh, very interesting. Seven total of the FJ-4 variants, including the A and B models, survive today. One of them is still in flying condition. Now for the opinion section, in which I will try to be brief because I have something like four aircraft to cover, uh, and I should first say that uh, if the recording in this sounds absolutely terrible, well, you're lucky it got recorded at all because recording this for some reason was a huge pain. I don't know why I couldn't hit any lines whatsoever. I gave you a blooper reel, but I didn't save any of the uh, messed up recordings, so... Sorry. Anyway, the FJ-1, uh, which I don't particularly like the look of. I think it's too uh, squat. It's not It's not long enough. I don't like the straight wing. It, it doesn't look particularly good to me. Its service career is about what's expected of a straight wing jet fighter uh, of the era. In fact, I'm a little surprised that the Navy maintained straight wing jet fighters as long as they did. Um... But overall, I, there's not anything particularly wrong with the design. It wasn't a great competitor to the F-9F Panther, but it was a competitor, although the F-9F is a much better aircraft. But that might just be because I like Grumman better. Uh, the FJ-2 and FJ-3 were more along the lines of the F-86 Sabre, and I'm a firm believer that the best way to paint an F-86 Sabre is not to paint it at all. Uh, something that the Navy just didn't do. It was either dark blue or flat gray neither of which looks particularly good on a Sabre. The only way to paint a Sabre in any good paint scheme is to do what the Germans did and do a camouflage thing. But apart from that, it's a gorgeous aircraft because it's an F-86 Sabre. Of course, though, the Navy has to paint them to keep them from corroding away into nothing. So, you know, if we, if we have to have paint on it, you know. Navy blue looks good on a lot of things. But, uh, I don't know, just... It loses something when it's not bare metal. However, as a Navy fighter, it's a fairly mediocre one because it's a conversion of an Air Force fighter, and that never goes particularly well. However, again, there's several howevers with this aircraft because it's a strange one, actually. Uh, I considered making this a, an, a, an uh, Ascendancy of the Terrible video, but there wasn't enough wrong with it to do it, uh, considering that its competitor was the F-7U Cutlass, and that was absolutely horrific. Um, anyway, I, as I go off on a tangent, the uh, the FJ-2 and 3 were not particularly good carrier fighters, because they were conversions. However, they were much better than other conversions, because, hey, at least when they landed, their landing gear didn't collapse on them. So, I mean, they, they worked, but the F-9F again was better. <laughs> Uh, I do like the all-cannon armament, which is, um, well, frankly, the two big swap-wing fighters in the Korean War didn't really get it right on either side. The F-86 didn't have a heavy enough armament with 650 caliber machine guns, although, admittedly, they were all in the nose, which was a much better configuration. But that wasn't particularly heavy enough. The MiG-15 was too heavy, because it was meant to shoot down bombers, which meant it didn't really carry enough ammunition for any kind of dogfight. 
I think the 420mm cannons is the ideal armament for jets in the era. Excuse me. I mean, the Hawker Hunter, you see this, it'd do the same thing. I think the Hawker Hunter has probably the best jet armament of the era. And the FJ-2 and 3, ha uh, and the FJ-4 for that matter, has it. The FJ-4, I think, is a better looking plane in that flat navy gray, because it's not actually an F-86 Sabre, uh, as far as looks go. I don't think it's a particularly good looking aircraft, but it's not ugly, like the FJ-1 is. The FJ-4 is probably the best of the lot um, for the era that it was in. The the FJ-2 and 3 were would have been great in Korea and through the 50s, but really they were kind of long in the tooth by the time they were getting retired, even though it wasn't a particularly long service career, but technology was expanding so much and mounting AIM-9 Sidewinders on FJ-3s. Uh, not particularly great. The FJ-4 was slightly better, but I think the only reason that it was still in service is because there wasn't a great alternative. I mean, your alternative was what the like the the swept wing version of the F-9F. Uh, I think the F-11F. That's a thing, isn't it? F-11F's a thing, right? If it's not a thing, let me know. And I've been living a lie, but I think it is. Uh. Or the F-7U Cutlass. <laughs> right. And when you get, start to see fighters like the F-4D, even though it wasn't a particularly successful one either, uh, you know, Navy fighters in this era are weird. I think the FJ-4 is probably the better designed because it's kind of so far away from being a conversion of an Air Force fighter that it's almost its own thing. It doesn't have a lot of the, like, inherent issues that most conversions have. Although, to be fair, the FJ-2 and 3 avoided a lot of those, too. Um, do I think the FJ series of fighters is particularly good? No. It's pretty mediocre. But it doesn't fit any of my criteria for an Ascendancy of the Terrible video. It wasn't badly designed. Uh, it wasn't badly implemented. It wasn't obsolete upon uh, implementation. And it wasn't absolutely terrible due to some other aspect, like some things are. Or any combination of those. So, it doesn't really need to be an Ascendancy of the Terrible video. However, it's also not a shining example of how to do a Navy fighter. The Navy didn't really have a great fighter for a long time, really until, if I'm being completely honest, the F-14 or the F-18. Um... They went through a lot of fighters in the 50s and 60s. The F-4 Phantom was a great interceptor, but wasn't a particularly good fighter. Vietnam is evidence of that. And... Yeah. But the FJ Fury served its purpose, and it served rather well. Certainly did a lot better than its competitors in some cases. <coughs> Seven U Cutlass. Um, yeah. So there you go. That's going to do it for this episode. I hope that made some sort of sense. Uh, I decided to do all these in one uh, episode because they're all very, very similar. They're all part of the same series. And none of them are really substantial enough to do a video to, to justify doing three separate videos and releasing them in three weeks. So, here you go. I'll try to do timestamps to point out which uh, plane I'm talking about. No promises. Um, if I forget, remind me. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. And I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.